their names, I'd like to greet you, friends, guests, and our nation's greetings of peace, as spoken in our original language of Arabic. Hi, salam alaikum. Hey, salam, sir. So how's everyone today? Are you hot? Yes, yeah, sir. You're not hot? No, sir. There's nothing wrong with being hot. You know, when you get energy, you get some heat. When you stay cool, that means that, you know, it's not really there. You know how we say we're chilling. I'm cool, calm, and collected. You know, where we want to be hot. We want to be on the fire with God's truth so that we will be moved to do something that will make us have better lives. So it is hot, and we happen to be in Southern California, and most of the country, well, Northern America, is experiencing summertime. But many of you know that if you came from the Midwest region or the East Coast, you know that two months later, it's going to be rain, hail, and snow. We hope not earthquakes, but there will be a change in season. So you know that California has a pleasant climate. You know, this is actually recycled desert. You know, you come to California and you see the palm trees swaying in the breeze and you see orange trees. And for many of us, it's a astounding experience because we have never seen fruit trees, you know, as you know, you see them, it's normal now, but before you looked at it like, wow, they really got orange trees. Where do oranges come from? And now it's just commonplace. But we want to welcome you out and we want to remind you that Muhammad's temple is a house of instruction. And being a house of instruction, we want you to put on your thinking cap. You know, come here with a questioning mind. Uh, we don't want you to just take everything that we say and say that's true. We want you to decide that you want to dissect it, analyze it, question it, turn it over, and try to disprove it. We want you to do all of those things so that you will be certain that you do have the truth when you come to your conclusion as to is this true or is this false. And I can tell you that this teaching, of course, I am a bit biased because I've been studying this teaching for a number of years, but I can say this, that there is nothing that I have found incorrect about this teaching. Now, there will be individuals that you meet that may not portray the activity of being a follower of Donald Elijah Muhammad or a follower of Minister Louis Farrakhan. There may be individuals that you find that way. But the teaching, or the teaching is a teaching that gives us life and more life. You know, all of the practices that we have been taught from 60 years ago, now you see the world taking on many of our programs and trying to present them as though they're own programs. You know, like the fitness fad that they have out now, everyone's trying to slim up and trim up and eat the right foods. Now, we've been doing that for over 60 years. You know, we've been trying to observe how to eat to live. And we've also been trying to observe how to eat to live mentally and spiritually. You know, we are, I guess you could call us the most praying people on the face of the planet because we pray five times a day and then sometimes more. And if you understand the situation of your life in this area called North America, you couldn't pray enough to guard yourself against the things that could happen to you in this world. And so when you look at the fact that there are all kinds of Muslims in all these different countries, you have to recognize that the Muslims in the other countries, they happen to have Islamic rule in their countries. Now, we don't have Islamic rule. So that gives us a more difficult time trying to respect God's law because we're in a country where pornography and child molestation and plea bargaining and all kinds of deviations is just the order of the day. Awesome. And it's something that's happening and you just say, well, oh, it's, it's normal. Now you've gotten numb to it. You know, you read it in the paper or you see it on the news and you find out this one got killed or this person did this wrong deed or that wrong deed. And it gets numb to you because you don't feel affected. But when you recognize the fact that you are trying to live your life according to God's law, then you see that you, in truth, are more superior than those who live in a culture that is predominated by an Islamic code of conduct. Because see, here, you won't get your hand cut off if you steal. You know, and you won't get your head cut off if you decide to be a fornicator. But that law will come into effect. And it's, it's not ready for us at this time. Well, I should say we are not ready for the law. Because 
almost all of us in the room would have to be forfeited. You know, not that I can read your mind and say that all of you are sinners, but I do know that none of us are perfect. And so with that in mind, we really aren't ready for Islamic law, but we are being introduced to it. And what we have in the nation of Islam is the restricted laws of Islam. And it's a code of conduct that keeps us straight, you know, because if you don't have strictness and discipline in any organization, it will fail. Because you have to have strong laws, because we are a people that give lip service to God. We say we love God and we want to do the right thing and we want the right thing to be done to us. But we are generally found wanting or doing other than what should be done. And so now, if we understand that the law of justice is a law that puts fear in us because we are not in the mindset of wanting to do what is pleasing to God, we understand that when the law of God is burning in our hearts and in our minds, then there won't have to be jails. There won't have to be a policeman, someone telling you, you made an infraction, we got to take you for this penalty or that penalty. And see, that's the road that we're striving to get on. You know, right now we're trying to perfect our character. We're trying to get away from the flaws that we have taken on as being uh, students or children of this society. You know, this society is called Christian America. And, you know, when I say Christian America, it's a way of life. You know, religion is truly a way of life. It's the way that you do all day, every day. It's not what you profess to be, because many of us profess. But now there's a distinct difference in the teachings of Jesus as opposed to the religion of Christianity. Because the religion of Christianity talks about what this nation's more is what their codes of kind of what they accept and what they will allow you to do. That is what Christianity really implies. And so what you want to do is be followers of Jesus. You want to do the works of Jesus. And you might say, that sounds funny. I thought you was a Muslim. I thought you were going to teach about Muhammad. But if you understand Jesus' work and you understand Muhammad's work, you see there's only a label difference. Only a label difference. They came to uplift fallen humanity. They came to get us to doing the things that we should do as brothers and sisters. And you notice in the nation of Islam, you hear the term brother, sister. And now, you know, it's a commonplace term, you know, but you generally think of it in terms of a black person when you say brother or sister. But in truth, our teaching is to become universal. We are to turn the whole world into being brothers and sisters, one big brotherhood. But we got to start at home first. We got to start with ourselves right. first. Because we are in most need of resurrection, and we have to learn how to love ourselves. If we don't do this, then we're subject to death by self destruction. You know, because it's like a suicide wish. You know, when you say, Well, I love the others, but I don't love myself, and the others don't intend to love or preserve you, then that's wishing for suicide. And this is the position of us as black people. We support everything else, and we don't generally see any good in ourselves. You know, we ride past the brother's business and go to the big concern. And, you know, of course, they have uh, a lot of propaganda and advertisement to draw on you, but you still should have enough sense to know that you should support your own. Every other group supports their own. They don't have a problem with that. You don't even have to teach them. They say, well, you, you know, I might try to sell someone of another nationality some sweets, and they I don't eat sweets. And I look at it like, well, they consider a different national diet, so they don't want sweet. I say, but then again, they would be buying it from their own kind if they bought it. You know, and I couldn't be angry with them. But see, in our case, we go completely opposite. We go to the other place. We ride 15 miles out to this spot that we heard about that they said is brand new to spend our money. And then we come back here and we think about our bills and we ride past the brother's spot and it's folded. It's going out of business. So we need to really consider that. We need to start supporting our own. We need to cultivate love and respect and support for our own kind. Now, the speaker, I can't get into his topic, but I do know that Brother did speak about AIDS. And he gave us a lot of information. If you were out Friday at Inglewood High, you probably got a lot of information. You may have thought that you already knew everything about AIDS. But the more that I hear about it, the more that I suspect that there are many other ways that this disease can be transmitted. And so your only protection is 
is in following the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Right. In other words, to capsulize it, doing the right thing. Because you might say, well, I'm not a fornicator. I got I got a wife. I don't you know, do anything outside of me and my wife. But now suppose there are other ways you can contract the disease. Now then you may be susceptible to contracting it and not knowing it and producing wow. children and just creating more you know, people that are going to suffer and ultimately die. So it's wise for all of us to get as much information as we can. And Dr. Ali spoke to us about a home testing plan. And I, that was very attractive to me because many of us don't want to go to a clinic. You know, it's almost like, well, there's something wrong with me? I don't want to find out. I, I'll be okay like this. If I know, then it's going to stress me out. I know most of us feel that way, and I can understand it. But to understand, it's more important than guessing. Because, you know, in the Bible, it says knowledge is the principal thing. But with all you're getting, you should get understanding. So we should understand what AIDS represents and try and master it, try to get around it, and try to warn all the others. So, how many of you have purchased the most current edition of the Final Call newspaper? Okay, good. Now, if you have not gotten it, you can get it before you leave. And you know, we have businesses that we need your support in. Remember, I just spoke about supporting black businesses. And sometimes the business uh, may not be to your liking. And I'm talking about what I personally experienced. And we have to understand that we're coming from a, a building process, you know, from the ground floor up. And so when people start business and they don't have expertise, you have to recognize that they may not serve you in the best manner. And so with that in mind, you have to almost bend over backwards to continue being slighted and saying, well, I understand that that may not be the most professional way to be dealt with, but I have to deal with this because this is our own. And so in that mode, I want you to know that we are growing and we are trying to create businesses of our own. And so because we are inexperienced, we may not treat you in the best form and fashion because the customer is always to be pleased and he is always correct. And so while we're in our forming stages, just bear with us, give us encouragement, and give us suggestions that will help us to create businesses that will live and serve you in the best form. So I hope everyone is attentive and I hope you have your mental pad out and ready to write and take in a lot of information that will be imparted to you. And at this time, I'd like to excuse myself and bring forth our next speaker. Please receive the Minister of Mars 27, Minister Charles X. Isalam Lake. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, in the name of the Exalted Christ, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and in the name of our standard bearer, our leader, teacher, and guide, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, I greet my brothers and my sisters with the greeting words of peace. As-salamu alaykum. Let's give Brother Minister Kenneth a round of applause for that. We hope that you are indeed relaxed because you are in for a treat today. Before we get further into our program, we would like to give recognition to uh, a sister who is up on the rostrum today Dr. Aliyah Kareem, who is working on the team with Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Justice, please give her a round of applause. And at this time, I would like to bring forth to the rostrum our beloved sister minister who's working hard in the Santa Ana area, who is going to introduce our next speaker. I want you to pay close attention to her and open your mind to receive some valuable information as she brings on Dr. Justice. Please receive Sister Minister Nuja X. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the most holy name of Allah, the Beneficent, 
the merciful, I bear witness that there is but one God whose proper name is Allah, who came to us here in the hells of North America in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. I further bear witness to the exalted Christ, the Jesus spoken of in the Bible and Holy Quran, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, May Allah be pleased with him and find favor with him forever. And I bear witness, last but not least, to the Christ in our midst, the God figure, the shining and prime example for manhood, and the guide and the leader and the teacher for us all in this day and this hour, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, a visionary, a master of the problems that surround us and confront us, the key, the answer book, one who is able to absolutely uplift us and bring us out of this condition into paradise. In their names, beloved, I would like to greet all of us in the greeting words of peace in our mother tongue. Assalamu alaikum. How are we all feeling this afternoon? All praise is due to Allah. Let us not fret because we feel a little bit warm. The fire of hell that will surely touch you for not being here is a lot hotter than what you're going through this okay. afternoon. Right. Okay. So bear the heat gladly. Yes, I'm so excited. The nation of Islam is not only on the cutting edge, we have actually surmounted, overcome the wisdom and the technology of this world to be able to cure the plague that has been spoken of in the scriptures. We, the nation of Islam, have been blessed by Allah under the guidance of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan to be able to be saviors, not just to our people, but to the whole of humanity, if they would but take mind. Yes. We have with us the brilliance, the best, the minds who have in them salvation for the people. Yes. The nation of Islam is taking on a new look. You see standing before you women who are and have always been the first on the scene when anything new is brought to birth. Is that right? Yes, sir. When you see the woman coming out as a shining new example of life, of upliftment, it is something to behold. Come on. But be assured that where you see the woman in a new role, in a new condition, taking on new responsibilities, uplifting the people to new heights, taking on new demands. The black God is there also. Right. If you are in awe of what the black woman is bringing for you, just wait until you see God. This is us. We are the people of God. That's right. That's right. It is always an honor for me to come before the people of God, and I want to thank take this time to thank the regional minister, Minister Wazir Muhammad, for allowing me this opportunity to come before you. I want to ask Allah to please help me share some of the excitement that I have with us so that we may receive the messages that are going to come to us from this rostrum that are absolutely life-saving messages for us and our people. Sure. I want to thank the local mosque minister, Minister Charles X, and of course our beloved sister, Captain, I don't see her in the room, and all of the laborers who are making it possible for us to be here and to continue to come with words of upliftment and hope and change and salvation and resurrection for our people in a time when everyone else has thrown us away. I want to take this time now to introduce and bring before you Dr. Barbara Justice. This is a sister who has dedicated her life to serve in the black community. She was a mother while she was attending medical school. She is currently in practice in general medicine in Harlem, in New York. She teaches and serves on the board of directors at Nair Educational Institute. And she hosts one of New York City's most popular Afrocentric medical education programs, Medical View and You. When the AIDS epidemic first started and the rapid spread of the AIDS virus continued, 
Dr. Justice began to investigate and research the treatments that were available. We look at AIDS as if it's something that affects us marginally, as opposed to something that was designed, perhaps, to affect us and only us very directly. Yes. She is today recognized as one of the leading authorities on the subject of the treatment for AIDS. And she is subject to calls both nationally and internationally quite frequently to answer questions that we have about this. We are indeed privileged and honored to have her with us this afternoon to speak to us and teach us the correct information about this dread disease. Right. She founded the African American Research Institute on AIDS. This is not a sister who took the knowledge that Allah blessed her to have access to and sat on it. She has taken whatever it is of knowledge that she has come into about this subject and she is sharing it willingly with us. We have to accept it and receive it that our lives may be saved. She is the United States representative for the Kenyan Medical Research Institute. She is a member of the Black Leadership Commission on AIDS. She is the clinical director of the Abundant Life Clinic, which all praise is due to Allah. I should say at this time we should give a great round of applause to that and the work of Dr. She's a board member of the International Organization of Tradition of Healers and Medical Practitioners, board member of Developing Africa Practically, and several other notable organizations. Throughout her life, she has remained a student of African history. She is focused on contributing to the development of the collective consciousness of black people that is sweeping across campuses and communities in black America. I ask that we receive her warmly Pay attention and listen to her and accept what she gives us, study it, and go out and be saviors for our people. I would like to greet you as I came before you and bring on Dr. Justice. Assalamu alaikum. and the merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. As-salamu alaykum. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure for me to be here with you this afternoon. This is my 14th day in the Nation of Islam. And even though I come with a great deal of information about uh, a number of topics, but indeed certainly about AIDS and the condition of our people in relationship to AIDS and the treatment. I come to you as a student, and I come to you as an infant, and hope to grow in knowledge and in understanding uh, under your guidance, so that understand that I step before you very humbly today and um, acknowledge acknowledging my great ignorance. Uh, when I was asked yesterday, I spoke before the MDT, and that was also a, a first for me and an honor. Uh, and I was asked to say uh, a few words to the group this morning, to the organization this morning. I, you know, came away pondering, well, what could I possibly say? I did not want to get up on a Saturday afternoon in a spiritual circumstance and, and give a repeat of the presentation that we made for the public or, or in more uh, academic forums. I wanted to say something that reflected the transformation that I'm going through. And I, I spoke to Dr. Kareem and I spoke to Dr. Muhammad and I said, well, what should I say? You know, what should I talk about? And Dr. Muhammad said, well, you have had the honor of spending time with the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And surely, the Minister has said things to you that would be of worth to share with your brothers and sisters. And that indeed, thank you, Dr. Muhammad, was a, a, an opening for me, a door that opened, that gave me uh, insight 
as to how I should approach even speaking to my brothers and sisters. Because, of course, Mr. Farrakhan, it's every word that comes from his mouth are, uh, uh, you know, pearls. And, and they're seeds. And they, they need to be planted. They need to be spread. They, they need to be planted within me. But I also need to go the Johnny Appleseed type of manner and spread those seeds around. So I thought about it. And I said, well, one of the one of the profound, many profound things that Minister Farrakhan said to me was that it was indeed a blessing to know your mission. That it was a blessing to know your mission. Because you see, I went, I used to call it waiting to live. You know, I kept preparing myself. I went through college and undergraduate school. I taught school in the public school system in New York City. Uh, I almost went to law school. I did graduate work at Columbia University. I went to Howard University Medical School. Uh, I, I did a surgical residency and became a general surgeon uh, under Dr. Mohammed's uh, tutelage. Uh, I then went and did a fellowship in, in cancer surgery. So I, I kept saying, I'm waiting to live. You know, what is it I'm preparing myself for? Right. But I knew that something was, was happening, that I was being prepared. I was not preparing myself. I often did not know what the next step in, in my pathway was. But I was preparing myself for something, and I, finally, it has been revealed to me what it is that I am to do and where I fit in. And indeed, it is a blessing to know one's mission. And as I looked at the nation, I understood the wider meaning of that statement. Because the people in the nation of Islam are truly blessed. Because you have been given the mission. You have been given the guidelines to save not only yourselves, but our people. And that mission is so ultimately important. It is a time of the apocalypse. It is a time that the forces of evil have reached their maximum and press in upon us with all due aplomb, with great vigor. But we are a mighty people. We are a mighty people. And we have been given mighty leadership and mighty guidance. And surely, we hold in our hands the answer to all of these questions, not just the question of AIDS, but the question of genocide, the spirit of the mind, as well as of the body. Our people are very ill, you know. We suffer from many, many syndromes. And Dr. Kareem and I had the occasion during this last four or five days to be talking about the different aspects of illness that have beset our people. We suffer from a, a malaise, a, a sleeping sickness that allows others with false messages and false directions to come in and guide us down pathways that are ultimately death for our people. Only those who have received the word will have the weapons and the keys to open those doorways. So surely your mission has been given to you. For each individual person, you must reach for the absolute best of yourself. You must strive. Whatever it is that we've been doing, it's not enough because the beast has not yet been stopped. So we have to redouble our efforts and move ahead and individually be the best that we can possibly be and then bring all those gifts and all those talents here to the nation and work hand in hand with each other to provide for the transformation that must surely take place. I want to thank you so much for allowing me to be with you today and I hope that you will continue to encircle me with the warmth and the knowledge so that I will grow in the wisdom that has been put before us by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you. As-salamu alaykum. Brothers and sisters, we want to hear from another sister who is in the medical profession. She is working diligently. Her specialty is psychiatry. She has now joined the team of Dr. Muhammad and Dr. Justice to work in the forefront on the West Coast as we thrust forward to deal with this problem and this dreaded disease, AIDS. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Alia Kareem. Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, who has 
blessed us to come to a solution as we have gone past time to take care of ourselves and our brothers and sisters. I once again greet you. I salam alaikum. Praise God. Brothers and sisters, over the past few weeks, Allah has blessed me to join you from time to time and to again uh, remind both myself and yourselves about the work that we are undertaking. At this time, we have been assessing a little bit and focusing on the political environment and the motivation of those who have brought the AIDS plagues into our communities, not only in the United States and not only on the Western continents, but more prominently in Africa and Asia, affecting our people up into the numbers of 12 million, 11 million being concentrated on the continent of Africa. And we realize that we have been misinformed by the beast who speaks with a forked tongue. And that beast has said to us, uh, this is a blemish on your society. It has been brought about by the perversion in your people practicing improper sexual relations and using illicit drugs and otherwise abusing themselves in their community. And the uh, connotation, the under communication in that, that sets up the incorrect environment is that God is visiting a plague on people who have sinned. They don't tell you that this is a man-made plague, that this plague has been visited on us for the usual genocidal reasons that all plagues have been visited on us in the last four to five hundred years, that this plague is visited on us for decimation of population so that the devil may have the financial control that That's he right. wants and the profits he intends to make. And therefore, our people that are being so sorely terrorized by this plague, as many families and mothers and the newborn babies and our hard-working brothers throughout the community are being laid low by this thing, we realize that this is yet another genocidal attempt on our community okay. and that we have, in a psychological manner, been misfocused and misdirected to look in the wrong direction so that we cannot mount a defense and come together as a community and take care of ourselves. I'm not going to spend a long time here, but let us, as we pray and work, because we're going to be working and crying for a long time, let us understand that it is the beast at the base and the God at the top taking us up. I Thank you. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, you know that we are in the midst of an election year, is that right? Yes, sir. And we have been weighing the words of different candidates that have traveled throughout the country. But you know, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad has taught us that we can't put all of our hope in politics. Because politics is not sufficient to deal with our spiritual disease that we have. So, he says if we can find someone who is willing to put the Muslim program that is on the inside of the last page of the Final Call newspaper before Congress, then we should back that kind of man. If we have politicians that are willing to go forth and speak boldly and forthrightly on behalf of our people, then we should back politicians like that. Well, our brother here, Dr. Muhammad, was just about to do that. Although he didn't complete the congressional race, he still gave an alternative to politics as usual by presenting another aspect of politics in so much as bringing truth to our people and standing up for our people and not making deals in the back rooms in which most politicians have involved themselves with. Yes, sir. In the political system of America, you have two main parties, is that right? Yes, sir. One the Democratic Party, one the Republican Party. 
One is represented by the donkey, the Democrats, is that right? Yes, sir. And one represented by the elephant, the Republican Party. Now, have you ever asked yourselves why these two animals representing these two parties and these two types of people that think, that think a certain way? Why these two animals? And why does, in the Bible, Jesus is riding into Jerusalem on a donkey? Yes, sir. Why a donkey? What is the representation of a donkey? And why in the Bible does it speak of so many different animals and gives parables dealing with animals? The sheep and the goat. The separation that must take place between the sheep and the goat. What is this talking about? And in the scripture of the Bible, where it talks about Jesus riding on the donkey, and it talks about death riding a pale horse, which is the subject for our brother today. What are we talking about? Death riding on a pale horse. Why a horse? And why is the color of the horse pale? Okay. These are some, are some things that we need to be asking ourselves. We want you to open up your mind as we bring before you, and now the time has arrived that our brother come forth, but I just want to share this with you about the character of our brother that's about to come before us. He's a man who loves our people. He's a man who stood with the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and now stands with the premier leader of black people and oppressed people all over the world, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. He loves us and he has demonstrated that love by the kind of work that he has done and that he is doing in the ministry and in the field of medicine dealing with this dreaded disease called AIDS. I had a recent conversation with my brother, Brother Chris X, who lives in Northern California. And he told me that brother was up there not long ago, and the amount of people that came to the event was not very many. And he said he was impressed with Dr. Aline's character because he spoke to the few that were in the audience just like he was speaking to 10,000. Yes, that is character. That is love. And with that, I'll bring it for you. But the minister, the minister of health and human resources for the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam, please receive our brother, our friend, our minister, Dr. Muhammad. the merciful, the all-wise, the true, and the living God, the God who is the Lord of all creation, who himself is self-created, and who has brought forth from himself all that have existence. We thank Allah for life itself. For truly without Allah we would not have life and we thank him for guidance in our lives that we might not spend our lives foolishly. We thank Allah for his messengers and prophets, his servants, who have taught us the great principles by which we should live and who have served every people and every nation has great exemplars of the principles of truth, freedom, justice, and equality. We are Muslims and we believe in all messengers and prophets and all that has been revealed to them. We believe in Abraham we believe in Moses, we believe in Jesus, we believe in Muhammad. 
But we would be world-class fools today if we tried to believe in all of the others and denied those that God has raised from our midst. So we believe in and we love the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. We believe in and we love the honorable Louis Farrakhan. And we believe in and we love the one who came to North America by himself to raise these two. And we don't care who dislikes Master Farrakhan. Muhammad. Whether they believe in him or not, we believe in him. And we don't mind being called by his name and put it into practice that which he taught. Yes, and we believe that Allah in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, just as he was able to back and protect the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in our midst for over 40 years, and is doing the same by Minister Farrakhan, we believe that even the least one of us, if we stand up in his name, we have that same divine backing and protection. <laughs> End, we will absolutely conquer all of our enemies, every one of them. And we care not how powerful they seem to be or how uh, disadvantaged we seem to be or how great the odds against victory seem to be. We have faith and trust in God that we are already the winners. So in the names of all righteous men and women, those that are living and those who have become ancestors and those that are yet to be born on the earth. Let me offer to you the greeting words of peace as we say it in the Arabic. As-salamu alaykum. sir. How's everyone this evening? sir. I too am fine giving thanks and praise to Allah, working hard in his name, trying to make my word my bond. And I want to thank our regional minister, Minister Wazir Mohammed uh, and his able staff for all that they have done over the past uh, several weeks and months in preparation for the events of the last few days. We are on a campaign of life against death. We are trying to save our people in the name of God from what we believe is a man-made biological weapon called AIDS that threatens really to destroy all of us. And if we do not mobilize ourselves and organize ourselves and get into action, and if we are not backed by God, then I fear that all of us are lost. But I feel confident that in the end, our efforts will prove victorious. You probably have received a flyer or seen it that our subject today is death rides a pale horse. Because if we are in a campaign or a war against death, then we need to describe the characteristics of death so that we know the enemy when we see it. If you think about it, which one of us has seen death? We know about death, but if death walked in the room, would we see it and recognize it as what it is? Or would we call it something else? Because we would fail to recognize the essential characteristics of death. And if we fail to recognize death and identify it accurately, then how can we guard ourselves against it right. and keep it out so that we can go on and fulfill our divine destiny given to us by God. Jesus had an enemy called death. He said, I am come that you might have life 
and have it more abundantly. Moses has a, had an enemy called death, masquerading and dressed up like Pharaoh. But the enemy was really death. And you see in the history of what Moses and Aaron did, a time came when the very existence of the people were threatened, where they were standing between the devil and the deep blue sea. And it looked like certain death. And so we need to study what that situation was like to see how they were able to make it over safely to the other side and live. Because indeed, we're faced with the same today. Yes, Muhammad had an enemy called death. It was the death of the spirit. The death of all that is true in religion that had to be warred against if the people, if the nation of Islam were to live. And if the kingdom of God were to be established. We should study his example because indeed 14 centuries after him we have exactly the same situation where all that we call religion, even that which is called Islam is not really that anymore. Come on. Because religion is designed to enhance life and to improve life. But wherever we see religion today, it looks more like death than it looks like life. Yes, and it seems that the more of this religion, whether it be called Christianity or Judaism or even Islam, that the people imbibe, the more the characteristic of death is there. Yes, we are the people that were called and still are called Negroes. Today we have learned through the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to reject such terms. Before we learn to reject the term ourselves, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad rejected it for us by referring to us as so-called Negro. Right. We have learned to reject it today because we have been given the definition of Negro as being an English word derived from the Greek. The Greek word being necros, which means that which is dead. And we were called dead because we were made that by our enemies. That's right. And so if we don't like what our enemies have done to us and the condition that they have produced for us, then we must reject the word that refers to that condition. That's right. So we reject the word Negro, but in fact, have we been resurrected from the dead state in which they put us? Come on. So that's why this subject that we want to talk about is really relevant. I was so happy that uh, I wasn't asked to talk about AIDS. Because <laughs> you know, sometimes you end up getting typecast. So they think the only subject you know to teach is AIDS. And so everywhere you go, they want to hear this subject. To tell us some more about this AIDS. <laughs> and I'm sure the same is happening with this. Sister Barbara Justice. Minister told her that that's already a holy name that she got. I don't think she's going to be Barbara X. <laughs> I think she's going to stay Barbara Justice. I understand. But they typecast you and put you in a little narrow area. And so I'm happy to have an opportunity to rise up out of that because the minister told me, he said, brother, now you're still a minister. I'm going to put you on a leave of absence from the ministry, but you're still a minister. 
And so I really have come to appreciate the value of being a minister. Even as I try to organize the medical department of the Nation of Islam, yet even in that there's a limitation because medicine is limited in its ability to help the people because what is wrong with the people is more than just what is physically there. What is wrong with us as a people is a very complicated, multi-dimensional problem and it cannot be addressed from a narrow point of view. You can't address it from the point of view of medicine alone. You can't address it from the point of view of politics alone. You can't address it from the point of view of religion alone. You can't address it from the point of view of economics alone or education alone. Come on. You've got to have some comprehensive way of wrapping it all up. And that's the value of what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was teaching. And that's the value of those who have been called out from among the people to participate in the mission of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. They're called ministers in the nation of Islam. Yes, sir. Male and female. Yes, sir. But you know, being a minister in the nation of Islam is a hard task. Yes. And most of those that you minister to they do not appreciate you. I know he's not appreciated. I know he's not appreciated because I'm not appreciated. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad warned the ministers that they should expect ingratitude. Have we been disappointed in that regard? No, we haven't. Because you teach your heart out to elevate the condition of the people and then most of them are ungrateful. They don't thank you. They pretend after a while that that which you taught them, that they were in the possession of it all along. And after getting a little teaching under their belt, then they want to turn on the teacher and pretend like they have a better wisdom than the teacher. And then they seek to replace the teaching. I know what I'm talking about. That's right. You don't have to bear witness if you don't want to. That's right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. We are faced today with the same thing that was in the world 6,000 years ago. Right. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad warned the ministers that 30% of the people that you teach, 3 out of 10, that you teach in the month will rise up against you to destroy you. Was he wrong? No, sir. No, sir. It's about like that. And that's a hell of a thing, isn't it? Yes, sir. That you're teaching the people knowing that 30% of those that you teach are going to use what you teach them against you. That you see them when they are in a state of uh, gross ignorance, blind, deaf, and dumb, and ignorant completely, in a grave of ignorance. Yes. And you, by the blessing of God and with the guidance of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, you teach them and raise them up out of a grave of ignorance. And when they are standing up on their own two feet now, then they raise their hand against you to destroy you. How ungrateful we are. That's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave us the true history of Moses in the wilderness. Telling us that Moses had a hard time to civilize the devil uh, 2000 B.C. He had to build a fire around himself to protect himself against those that he was trying to lift up. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you keep the fire burning, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Otherwise, they will sneak in on you. And seek to destroy you.
when a general is getting ready to wage war, then the general has to inform the people what the objectives of the campaign are. He has to win their support. War usually means that a great price and sacrifice, pain, suffering, and death is about to be exacted from the people and without the support of the people, then the war can never be successfully waged. Well, you and I are in a war. I know some of you don't know that. Some of us are so ignorant, we don't even know we have an enemy. That's right. We we look at our condition and we actually think that this is just the way the cookie crumbles. And we're very careful not to blame anybody for our condition unless it's one of our own. We are very unforgiving towards one another as black people. Quick to take offense with one another. You better not say something out of your mouth, sister, to your sister that is other than 100% correct because if there's even the slight hint of some kind of slight or insult in it, your sister will rise up against you and hate you and fight against you. In and out of the ranks of the MGT. Same with you too, brother. You let your brother just offend you in a little thing where you don't get the respect or uh, the acknowledgement that you think that you are due. That the captain don't recognize you uh, for selling uh, what you sold. Or for other work or duty that is put on you. If you don't feel like you're being treated right, even in a little thing, then that becomes grounds in your mind to become a rebel against authority and to even fight to undermine the whole structure of the mosque and the nation. We found that out recently in Washington, D.C. Just last month, we found a brother in the ranks. We thought he was a good brother. We found out he was a paid government agent. Oh, Oh, yes. Here he is, a black man. In the ranks with other black men who are seeking to do something for self to uplift our condition and here's a black man in a bow tie and a white shirt saying assalamu alaikum and rubbing uh, bean pie crumbs off his mouth. (laughs) (laughs) He was eight. He was trying to kill the brotherhood. He said his mission was to disrupt everything. We caught him because he stole some money and blamed it on the secretary. He won the trust of the secretary and the captain because they didn't know the characteristics of an agent. See, we can recognize some of the enemy, but sometimes the enemy don't come like we expected. If there's a problem of transportation in the mob, where it's hard to move people 
from point to point. That's a perfect opportunity for agent. The agent that's here reports back. They got a problem with transportation. They can't get the minister where he needs to go. Can't get the captain where he needs to go. The sisters are grumbling because they don't get a ride home after the mom's meeting because they don't have enough cars down there. So how do you think the agent's going to show up? With a nice shiny car. <laughs> Anybody need a ride? They find out there's some problem down there in keeping track of the money. Because nobody really knows how to keep the books right. Always bouncing checks and problems like that coming up. I don't know if that happens here. Yes. This is just a for instance. Yes. <laughs> but what does the agent look like when he shows up? Oh, I got a degree. I'm a CPA. <laughs> I can put in an automated system in the mouth and keep everything straight. Uh -huh. Listen. Jesus. See, that's how the devil or the enemy takes over the mosque by default. Right. Right. Since you ain't got a car and then it's known that you don't have transportation, we'll send you what you need. Yes. Since you need someone with a county. Uh, expertise. We'll send that into the mouth. Or whatever it is that the need is, we'll send that. And that one that we send with that might be the agent. Yes. Right. How do we view it, though? We view it as a blessing from Allah. Oh, Allah, thank you for sending this brother. And Allah may never have sent that brother. This one sent by the devil. Which would you rather have over the money? An agent with a degree in accounting or your half-literate brother or sister that's honest? I said, which would you rather have? You'd rather have the honest one, even though he might be slow with the figures. But yet, ultimately, he's better than the one with the skill because he has the characteristic of honesty. He's a good character. He's a Muslim, and the other one is a snake in the grass. That's right. That's right. He's not a snake in the grass because he has qualification or because he has a degree, but it is the way in which it is being employed. Yes, sir. That's how sometimes... Death can come in disguised as life. The enemy can come in disguised as a friend. The Bible warns us of uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. And you have to be astute enough, you have to be keen enough in your vision to be able to detect the characteristics of that. And if you want to Say, what is the objective of God since the beginning of time? The beginning, the, the, the beginning and ending objective of God is to establish life in the universe. God first brought himself into existence out of a state of non-existence. Yes, Isn't that right? That's right. The Holy Ghost one says, keep your duty to your Lord who created you from a single being and created its mate of the same kind and brought forth from these two many men and women. And we have many men and women today covering the earth, but it all had its origin in a single being in the beginning. And so the agenda of God is to produce life and reproduce that life and multiply that life all over the earth. Yes, and he's not a law the stingy. Yes, he is a law the beneficent. Yes, and so every life that he brings or allows to be brought, he provides for his sustenance and his nurture. Yes, but what is the objective of Satan? It's just the opposite. 
to destroy life. To, de to destroy the life of every creature that God has created and ultimately to destroy God himself. Are you listening? Yes, sir. So there is and always has been a great war raging between existence and non-existence, between life and death, between that which, which is progressive and uplifting and that which is regressive and down pressing. That which is good and that which is evil. That which is true and that which is false. That which is good, that which is true are those principles that uphold life. That extend and enhance and improve upon the life that God created. Those things are considered evil which are against the principle of life. So the Holy Quran says we have made unlawful to you only those things that are harmful. Harmful to your life. Harmful to you as a man or a woman in the image and the likeness of God. Everything else is made lawful to you because it actually helps you to develop and grow into the image and likeness of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't you want to be like God? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the interesting question. Don't you want to be like God? Yes, sir. Or would you rather be different than God? If God is called the ever living, don't you want to be like God? Yes, sir. Because if you are different than God in that respect, then you become the ever dead. How would you approach the problem of becoming like God? How would a person like you or me actually become at a certain point like God? One, th one thing to say that you want to be like God, but now what is the pathway? What is the process that if I follow it, then one day I will be like him? Well, if I want to be like Magic Johnson, what would I do? I chase a whole lot of women, right? And then in my spare time, play basketball. Matter of fact, you can be like Magic Johnson without playing basketball. Because ultimately, I mean, let's look at it from a realistic point of view. Ultimately, his destiny is going to be determined more by unrighteous behavior than by basketball. Jesus said that what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul or some translators have it and lose his life and we're not talking necessarily about the physical life alone because the life of a human being is not just the flesh and blood but the life of a human being is the mind and more than the body and the mind it is the spirit. We become like God, not in the flesh. We can become more like God in our minds if we allow his mind to be in us by 
studying, which is to say, eating his words. In the physical sense, it's very easy for us to understand that we are what we eat. That's why some of you in the audience right now, you look very ugly. You know why? Because you eat ham bones. Yes, you do. You eat shrimp and oysters and crab meat. You eat ugly food. You're not really ugly. Because as my grandmother told me, God don't like ugly. That's why when you checked in as a little baby boy or a little baby girl, you were such a beautiful baby. But now what happened to you? Something has gone wrong, hasn't it? Yes, sir. And what has gone wrong is that your life has not been properly nourished. You were given the wrong food to eat, physical food and mental food, and that's what makes you so ugly today. And you notice how pretty the Muslims get. I mean, I'm not posting now. I'm just saying, have you noticed? Both the brothers and the sisters, they start looking good. And some of the best looking Muslims that you see in the room, they, once upon a time, was ugly. I'm about ugly. When they joined the nation, they were just as ugly as they could be. Terrible looking people. I was one. I was the type of person that would actually scare you just to look at me. I was so wild and crazy and savage. I looked like somebody that would just about do anything. And I would. They told me that the devil probably heed the sigh of relief when I joined the nation. <laughs> So it's easy for us to see that if we improve our physical diet, then physically we become better looking people, don't we? We start eating pure food, staying away from poison food and poison drink and not uh, smoking, not drinking alcohol, not using any drugs whatsoever. Then people start to notice right away something something is up. There's a change. There's a transformation taking place. If you were big and fat and overweight and you start eating one meal a day, then you start slimming down. That's how we can tell those of you who actually follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, my followers eat one meal or uh, every day or one meal every other day. That's what his followers do. That's why we know some of you ain't really following. Because you wouldn't be weighing 300 pounds if you was really following the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I didn't get no applause on that point. I don't care. Because sometimes the truth hurts, don't you? I mean, sometimes the truth is just like a big pin and somebody done stuck it. And I look like I enjoy it, don't I? <laughs> but I do enjoy it. Yes, sir. Because I know it's good for you. That's right. I learned part of that being a doctor. Here you got somebody with a big abscess and a boil and full of pus, and they're suffering in terrible pain. And then here I come with my scalpel and a smile on my face. <laughs> What am I, some sadistic monster? No, I know. If I, the sooner I get there and cut that thing open and let that pus out, the better the person's going to be. Now, they might not feel that way when they see me coming. Or when they feel that blade, they might not think I'm their friend. But later on, when the pus is drained out and the healing has begun and they start to return to a normal health, some of them, not all of them, but some of them, they actually say, thank you, Doc. I appreciate what you did. Thank you, God. Those that have little understanding say, I'm going to get the hell out of here as soon as I can. They don't understand. 
if a change in the physical diet can have such a profound effect on the physical body, what about the mental diet? Come on. Because Jesus said it again. I mean, I know I quote Jesus a lot for a movement. We quote, quote Jesus more than the Christians do. But most of the Christians is afraid to quote Jesus too much. Because when you start quoting men like Jesus, that'll get you in trouble with the wicked. And if you're trying to be politically correct and all of that, man, you can't quote Jesus too much. Because he'll get you in the same trouble that he got in. He was in trouble with the Jews, wasn't he? Yes, sir. So you better watch your step in how you quote Jesus. Otherwise, these Jews today will hate you every bit as much as they hated Jesus 2,000 years ago. That's right. And some of you might not know it, but the Jews were the worst opponents of Prophet Muhammad. So you better watch how you quote this Holy Quran, because if you start quoting this Holy Quran too much, you're going to have enemies among the Jewish people. Yes, sir. But Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, even if it's health bread, whole grain bread, whole wheat toast that's been baked two or three times, like the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. But man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. You should eat the word of God like you eat food. You should chomp down on it and chew it up and masticate it and swallow it and allow it to be digested and absorbed in the mind, just as you do that with physical food in the body. If you eat the wrong kind of words, then you become the wrong kind of person. That's right. That's what's wrong with most of our people today. Not only were they given the wrong physical food, but the wrong words were spoken to them when they were little boys and little girls. If someone speaks to a boy the words of truth, then he will grow up to be a man in the image and the likeness of God. But that same little boy or little girl, if spoken lies to, then that one will grow up to be a devil. Yes, sir. Right. And will never be able to carry out the will of God. If you want the people to be better, then you've got to teach them better. You've got to examine what has been fed into their minds. If I look at a behavior among our people and I don't like that behavior, then I have to find out what is the source of it. And the source of it was a certain kind of teaching that they received. That's right. And the problem with us is that we have never been under a righteous teacher since we were made slaves here in the wilderness of North America. That's right. I watched a movie last night in the hotel called Goodfellas. Has anybody seen that movie too? Yes, I said I watched it in my hotel room. Because Minister Farrakhan has forbidden the Muslims to go to the movie theater. Yes, sir. That's right. He did, didn't he? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. After he forbid us to go to the movie theaters, in other words, putting back into effect the rules and regulations of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's right. Then somebody told me, well, Brother Alim, you're a minister. You, you, you got to go to the movies because you got to keep up with the minds of the people. I said, huh? <laughs> Went to another city. Somebody told me the same thing. Well, the minister, uh, 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 he changed his mind about that. I said, huh? <laughs> went to another city. Went to Chicago, in fact. They told me, well, what the minister really meant was, if the movie theater is in the white neighborhood, don't go to it. <laughs> but it's okay if you go in the black neighborhood. The next chance I got at the dinner table, the minister opened it up for questions. I 
said, Brother, Brother Minister Farrakhan, I said, I'm a little bit confused. Have you changed your instruction about going to the movies? <laughs> changed it? I said, yes, sir. And I told him what I had been hearing. He said, Brother, I haven't changed anything. I haven't changed my instruction. It's the same instruction. Go ahead, brother. Well, where did these changes come from? From wicked people who don't like the words spoken by the messenger of Allah in their midst. And so they, like the Jews, change or alter the words out of their places. So that rather than receiving good guidance, the guidance of God is now taken out of it. Yes, sir. And the people are conducted into hell. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's a grievous sin. Because I personally believe, I don't know if you believe it. I can't speak about nobody else's belief but mine. I don't know what's in your heart. I know what comes out of your mouth sometimes. But sometimes what comes out of the mouth is not in the heart. That's right. But I believe that Minister Farrakhan is a divine leader. Yes, sir. That's what I believe. Yes, sir. By divine, I mean he's got a special relationship with God. That's right. That he's guided directly by God. Yes, that he ain't getting what he got out of a book. Right. He ain't sitting down with some advisors Come on. that advise him and counsel him and then he just uh, finds out which way the uh, opinion poll is going. Come on. And then he comes out with some opinion that is consistent with what he was told. I don't believe that. Sure. Maybe you believe it. I don't. No, sir. No, sir. I think Minister Farrakhan is divinely bad in everything that he says and everything that he does. And what that means to me, it might not mean the same thing to you, but what that means to me is that he does not make a mistake in his guidance of us. Let me say that again. He does not make mistakes in his guidance of us as a people. And when he speaks to us and gives guidance from Allah to us, we should take what he says or else leave it alone. But don't take it and then change it to suit your own individual desire. Yes, sir. I didn't get much of a response on that. Oh. Now you're mad. Now you're half mad because I'm stepping right on your corns and your bunions. Because you know you love to do that. Yes, sir. Change the teachings. Right. So you can keep on doing what you're doing. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Try to find some loophole that you can crawl through. And that's what you do. You're down all on your belly, crawling in the mud. Trying to get through some loophole in the law. Yes, sir. And when you like that, or when we're like that, because I don't take myself out of it, then we're not feeding our minds properly. It's like taking pure water or some pure drink and then poisoning it. You know how they do, they make mixed drinks. They start off good. Got some fruit punch. That's right. Come on. Got pure, fresh, squeezed orange juice, pineapple juice, cherry root juice, grape juice. Got a maraschino cherry on top. Man, all that's good stuff. Then they ruin it, don't they? Yes. Then they put some Bacardi rum in there. Come on, man. Now it's something that would have uh, meant life to you, it means death to you, doesn't it? Go ahead, brother. Come on, brother. Pick us up. 
And what we say of the body and the mind is true of the spirit, yes, sir. which is the true life of us. That if we feed the body wrong and feed the mind wrong, then the body will be sick and the mind will be crazy. But if we misfeed the spirit, then we suffer a death from which we cannot be resurrected. Right. It's better to sacrifice the body and preserve the soul. It's better to sacrifice the mind and preserve the soul. Because the soul or the spirit of you is the essence of God in you. But when you deny the spirit of God within you and begin to disbelieve in the essence of spirit of God within you, then that is, in the language of the Bible, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. And when you destroy that part of you, or as Minister Farrakhan has given it to us in the study guides, when that voice of God speaks from within you, that small, quiet voice, which is the messenger of God speaking to you from the inside. When you assassinate that one and destroy that one, then you have removed the means by which you could be saved. talking about three major areas in which the battle of life against death takes place. It takes place in the physical realm. It takes place in the mental realm. And it takes place in the spiritual realm. Are you with me so far? Yes, Yes, sir. sir. Our objective should be life. And by that we mean the life of God. We don't want any other life. Matter of fact, we don't know any other life. That's right. If you think that there's some other life other than the life of God, then what you have identified as life is actually death. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the ends thereof thereof is death. (laughs) When you wake up, and you discover that you are a Negro. (laughs) Even if it's so-called Negro. Then you are discovering that you are the victim of a death plot. And that you have already suffered spiritual death. Yes, sir. And you have already suffered mental death. And you're on your way physically. Now that's that's a hard concept. That's a real hard concept. When you wake up and discover that you are a Negro... Most of us get defensive on that. But I know what you said when I said what I said. You said, I ain't no dick bro. <laughs> Didn't you? You ain't talking to me. Yes, sir. I ain't no dick bro. That's right. Come on. That's what we say. Come on. I'm a black man. Come on. You ain't doing like a black man. 
Donald W. Elijah Muhammad said the original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, the God of the universe. You ain't, wait, wait. What are you making? What do you own? You're the cream, but where have you risen to? Are you the God of the universe that you're supposed to be? I'm talking back to me now. Don't be lying to me. <laughs> if you was all of that, if we were all of that, we would not be in the condition that you see today. That's right. That's right. Look, I ain't just talking about outside the mosque. I'm talking about inside the mosque. That's if we right. were that. Right. Good. We wouldn't have these troubles and plagues and problems. That's right. And you wouldn't be in the condition that you're in right now. That's right. Because if you really understood what it is to be God, you mean to tell me God would sit in your condition as you are sitting Come on, and not do nothing about it? Come on. That's right. Good. So no, that's why I say, when you wake up and realize that you are a Negro, Come on. Yes, sir. you got to have a little bit of knowledge just to wake up to the fact that you are a Negro. That's right. That's right. That's right. When you wake up, then that means that you have the capacity in your mind to step away from yourself and look back down on yourself on your condition and give a scientific and objective analysis of your condition. Yes, sir. Can you really see what you look like? If you're ugly and out of shape and sick physically, do you mean to tell me that you're really seeing that? Because if you were really seeing it like it is, you would change it. But many of us resist the change, don't we? Yes, sir. Even after Minister Farrakhan says that fat is ugly in the eyesight of God, you ain't seeing it from the eyesight of God, are you? Because you, you're looking at them roles, you say, that's my fact. <laughs> and you get just as offended when somebody talks about your big fat behind. <laughs> just like there's something good in that big fat behind you got. <laughs> just like you're proud of them hog bumps coming up on your face. Come on, carbuncles and pus, pu pustules <laughs> and boils and whatnot breaking out on your body. Come on. And hemorrhoids and ulcers and heart attacks and high blood pressure and stress and all of the things that you're suffering from. Many of us actually get defensive when somebody points out that, you know, your blood pressure really shouldn't be that high. Awesome. You make an excuse. That's right. Go ahead. Doctor, what are you talking about? <laughs> Go give me a second opinion. <laughs> Do you really see your mind? Yes, sir. Have you analyzed it to see how your mind actually works? Because really, if we did, we would find out that we hardly get any value out of having a mind at all. Like what the Urban League says is true. A mind is a terrible thing to waste, and there's much wastage of mental power among us as a people. That's right. Yes, sir. Do you think that you actually get the best out of your mind? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. With everything that somebody tells you, you forget? Sir. You got problems, and here you have the greatest computer in existence in the universe, but yet you're looking dead at your problems, and you can't come up with a solution to your problems? That shows you that something is wrong here. Right. If your mind was a living mind, you would solve your problems at once. Yes, sir. 
Say, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to educate myself. You pick up a book. Because you heard the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, everything you need to know is written down in the book. By the time you get to the bottom of the first page, you don't go on to sleep. <laughs> you can't even make your mind stay awake and pay attention to that which would pull it up out of a grave of ignorance. That's right. Come on. Yes, sir. And then spiritually, same thing, isn't it? Yes, sir. That if we could really see our spirit, it's like a dead spirit. Yes, right. An evil spirit. Right. Not the spirit of life, not the spirit of love in many cases, but just the opposite. Every now and then we have an outbreak of something of the spirit that is really good. In the church, they say that oh, we got the Holy Ghost. That's something. The Rev was really preaching. And it got good in there. But then how rapidly it goes back to being bad. Same thing among us, isn't it? Sometimes uh, we have a spiritual impulse, which is really divine, which is really good. And we actually say the right thing. And we actually do the right thing. But how easy it is for us to fall back. Yes, into yes, spiritual sir. death yes, sir. where we start expressing anger and hostility and resentment yes, and uh, uh, jealousy and envy and all of these pathologies of the spirit yes, that is so common in the world right. but every now and then we hit that high note don't we yes, sir. and with the mind the same way every now and, now and then the mind does something that amazes us where we understand something or see something we get a, 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 an insight yes, it's like the, the lightning when it flashes, it shows up everything for a split second, and then it goes back into darkness. That's how our mind is sometimes. Physically the same thing. Sometimes our bodies just seem to click right. If we're involved in sports, sometimes, I mean, we're running, and it's almost like our feet don't touch the ground. We're jumping and we can just do whatever it is that we want to do physically. Or we can work and work and work and we don't seem to get tired. Everything is clicking, but most of the time it ain't like that. Most of the time we just broke down and tired. But these little momentary glimpses is showing us what life is really supposed to be like. That you're supposed to have that physical energy and power all the time. That physical beauty all the time. Health and well-being and balance all the time. That's your natural state. That mental brilliance. That's your natural state. Where you look at the universe around you and there's instant recognition and understanding. That's the mind of God. He don't look at something and get mystified by it. Sometimes we call it intuition. That we just know things and we don't know how we know it. That's the natural state of your mind. Yes. Sometimes we do things that are made. We tune in with other people. Right. That the thought that's in my mind is exactly the same thought that's in your mind. Yes, I was getting ready to call you, but before I could reach the phone, the phone is ringing and it's you. You was calling me. Yes, sir. <laughs> and sometimes the spirit is like that too. Sometimes in a moment of crisis, especially when our back is up against the wall. And we know can't nobody save us but God. Then somehow or other the power of God is right there in us. Yes, sir. That's right. We might be confronted with something uh, that would really uh, be impossible uh, to overcome. But somehow or other up out of us comes the spirit, the very spirit and power of God. And we overcome that which can't be overcome. Right. Yes, Except that God be with us. Yes, sir. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sometimes words can't really express 
what it is. But the words can lead you up to the threshold of what it is. All right. yes, sir. And that's what I'm hoping that the words that you're hearing are doing for you. That it takes you up to the threshold of the reality. The words are not the reality. It takes you to the threshold. And with an act of faith, you can leap into the reality. Yes, which is to say the life of God. Yes, but it's easy for me to talk, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, sir. That's the luxury of being a preacher. <laughs> it ain't the preaching that's so hard, it's the practice. That's the hard part. That's right. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that in this wicked world, when we say that we wish to be good, <coughs> this wicked world will try us to see if we really mean to be good. So if you are struggling and striving to be good on the physical, the mental, and the spiritual plane, to make yourself in the image and after the likeness of God, then you are in a world that is hostile to that. And it will drag you down and pull you down and try to reverse your course or distract you into a deviant direction. Right. To take you off the course to a life with God and conduct you to death. Death rides a pair of horses. Now maybe I can sum up my subject. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be like this. I had another idea in mind when I stood up here. Yes, sir. Now I'm remembering what I was supposed to be talking about. See, teaching Islam is like playing jazz. Sometimes you go out there, man. And Earl Father Hines said the trick is to see if you can make it back to the fifth melody. Because sometimes you can go so far out there, you, you just get lost. Yes, <laughs> so maybe Allah bless us to get back and tie it up. See, I, I, the thing that bothered me about that subject, death rides a pale horse, see, that's the negative side of the subject. So looking at it, what has really happened so far is that is the subject that I've been teaching. I've just been teaching it on the positive side. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Instead of talking about what death is like and where death comes from and its nature and characteristics, we've been talking about life. Yes, sir. That's the flip side of the same coin called death. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now let's look at that scripture in Revelation chapter 6 verse 8 it says and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that rode upon him was dead. Now wait a minute. Who's speaking here? Come on. Good question. It says, I look. Good. Well, who is the I that is speaking? Well, it's the author of the book of Revelations. Right. Come on. If you go back to the beginning of the book of Revelations, which is the last book placed in the Bible, it is actually called the Revelation of St. John the Divine yes, sir. from the Isle of Patmos. Now, despite the fact that it is placed last, in the among the books of the Bible, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said Revelations really 
was the first book written yes, sir. of the Bible. But it is placed last because it is the revelation showing you the end times of the present world of 6,000 years. Yes, sir. It was actually written more than 6,000 years ago. Well, if it was written more than 6,000 years ago, then how could the author of the book be a man called John? Since John is an English name, and the English language is only 700 years old, how could that man have been called John? Come on. They must have just recently started calling him John. So what was he called before he got to be called John? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that the English name John is derived from the Hebrew Jacob. But even that does not solve the problem because Hebrew is just a little over 4,000 years old. So what was the man's name before he was called Jacob? Well, now you're back to the original language Arabic, and in Arabic, his name was Yakul. <laughs> so you ask the question, what's in a name? <laughs> Everything is in the name. <laughs> what was your name before they called you John? Or Willie. Or Matilda. Right. If things ain't what they seem to be, then neither are you. That's right. You seem to be dead. But are you really? Well, who is this Yaku? Prophesying from the Isle of Patmos. Well, the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad recognize that name. That we heard of Yahoo. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us about Yahoo a long time ago. Yes, sir. Matter of fact, Yahoo, that's the father of the devil. And when we say the devil, we don't mean some man down in the ground in a red suit. No, we ain't worried about no devil like that. We ain't never suffered nothing under a devil like that. But the one we have caught hell from is not a devil in the ground. It's the devil on top of the ground. It's the Caucasian white man. Jesus. Wait a minute, now somebody might have got confused. Because they started clapping too soon. They might have thought I said that the Caucasian white man is a devil. No, I didn't say a devil. I said that is the devil. When you read, when you read of devil in the Bible, in the Holy One, it is talking about that Caucasian white man who is Yaqub's grafted devil. Devil is a word with a scientific meaning. That's right. When we call him devil, we're not calling him out of his name. No, sir. When somebody calls you out of your name, you are justified in being offended. But the white man is not offended by being called devil. That's right. He knows that's his name. That's he right. just wished we wouldn't use it. That's right. In the 60-year teaching of Yaku and the making of the devil, the white man has never denied that he's the devil. That's right. That's right. He just said, I just wish y'all wouldn't say that. <laughs> and quite naturally, he wished we wouldn't say that because when you find out he's the devil, then you don't want to follow him no more. As long as you think that white people is some kind of holy people, then you love to follow them. You love to have their picture up in your uh, house. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> 
you feel good about that. A blonde hair, blue eyed, a hippie. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. And you're hoping one day to be washed in his blood. How can you wash somebody? Wash somebody's blood. <laughs> you want to be washed in the blood of Jesus so he can turn you white as snow. <laughs> That's what you're hoping for. <laughs> and until you get that, then you just go down to the corner drugstore and get some bleaching cream. And try to lighten up as best you can <laughs> with these limited means. <laughs> If you went down there one day and they had the blood of Jesus in a bottle, you'd buy that, wouldn't you? That's right. Yes, you would. you buying blue contact lenses. Somebody's buying them. Certainly ain't blue-eyed people. It must be people that wish to not tell the truth now. If you, if you had got your uh, assignment, say, well, now you're going to be born on August the 15th, 1992. Now, uh, you're going to be, uh, let's see, let's look this up. You're going to be born in uh, Los Angeles General Hospital in the United States of America. <laughs> now, this country is ruled under white supremacy. Come on. Always has been, always will be. Right. If you are black in America, then you're going to catch hell all the days of your life. <laughs> If you're born white now, then you will have everything uh, open up to you. That's right. And nothing will be denied. Now, all you got to do is just check off which one you want to be. Go ahead. <laughs> now, if you had had that choice now, they ain't that honest. <laughs> they ain't that honest. They ask too hard a question to ask you to answer at this point. Because you'd be lying up here in the mouth. And we don't, want, we don't want to tempt you to tell such a big lie. That'll be a dark stain against your soul. So let's just say it would have been a hard decision. I mean, I want to be a soul brother and everything, but... <laughs> What was that? Y'all stop it. Get me off my subject. I was talking about Yaku. It's a serious subject, too. And y'all sitting up here laughing. Come on, rolling in the house. Now, let's get serious, y'all. We're talking about death. Riding a pale horse. Well, how did death get to ride a pale horse? I thought the good guys got to ride the pale horses. I mean, John Wayne was on the white horse. And Roy Rogers and all the good guys. Now I hear the Bible got it all twisted up. It said death is riding the pale horse. <laughs> the Arab Elijah Muhammad has straightened all of this out. So that we can really understand. That's right. He said that when you look at the Caucasian white man, you are looking at death. That is death. In him and under him, we have suffered death. Physical, mental, and spiritual. Everything that he has ever given to you, whether it is physical food, mental food, or spiritual food, has brought about your and my death. He don't have nothing to offer you but death. We are begging him for freedom, justice, and equality, but we haven't got that from him yet, have we? No, no, no. You thought Rodney King was going to get justice. <laughs> and you were so disappointed when you didn't get justice. 
But our grandparents used to tell us, you can't get blood from a turnip. Now, I was mystified. I said, now, why do they always say that? I actually was kind of old before I figured it out. The reason you don't get no blood from a turnip is because ain't no blood in a turnip. I mean, I was real dumb. I don't know about you, but I was real dumb. I mean, I couldn't hardly understand nothing. Now, if you say that you understand that you can't get blood from a turnip, then how is it that you don't understand that you ain't going to get no justice from white folks? That's right. Ain't no justice in them. How come ain't justice in them? No freedom, no equality, nothing of truth. Nothing of life. How come we can make that kind of a bold statement and say it's not in them? Because we know how they were made. This is what the history of Yakub gives us. They are made people. That's right. If you take your car to the mechanic, he knows what's in it when you drive up in it. He knows whether you got a carburetor or a fuel injector. Because he looked at that car and said, oh, no, they ain't got no carburetor in it. Man, you telling me something wrong with your carburetor. They ain't got no carburetor in the car. This one of them electronic fuel injected engines, fool. So you taking white folks, taking them for granted, like they got what you got. Come on. You know that you have a sense of justice. You know when somebody's mistreating you, and you know when you're mistreating somebody. You know when you're lying, and you know when you're telling the truth. You know how to be good, and you know how to be bad. And predominantly, what you like to do, you really like to be good. Yes, Talking about predominantly, when you think that you can do it, then you will do yes, the good thing. But you have heard that since this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, yes, then you better do unto others before they have a chance to do unto you. Yes, but now, that's not really natural with you. That's right. I mean, you try to lie with the best of them, Come on. but you really don't have no talent for that. I mean, I, I heard that the blood and the crisps, robbing people and stealing stuff, but y'all ain't really no thieves. That's right. Number one, you get caught too much. <laughs> and you, you don't need to be caught. Now. You're in the wrong business. You don't have no talent for stuff like that. No. Matter of fact, if you're going to steal something, why don't you steal L.A.? Why not? Why not? You all had a rebellion, had a war, had a rap. Well, what did you take? They show, I mean, I'm from the East Coast now. I don't know what the reality was, but what I saw on TV was you was running down the street with a TV set on your shoulder. That's what they do. I said, now, what are the Negroes taking TV sets for? Why don't they take the neighborhood? Why don't they take the project? Just take it. Take the bank. Got a whole bank in your neighborhood. Why don't you just take the bank? Take the supermarket. Take the city. Tell white folks, we got this now. We done stole it from you. Just like you stole it. Now we done stole it. We have been copycatting after you, learning after you. Now, we have become the gangsters. Now, if you all did something like that, then you would probably get some respect. I mean, I'm not advocating that you do that. But I'm saying, if, if you declare yourself to be, you know, this kind of a thief, this kind of a criminal, then why not be a, a successful criminal? Be a big criminal. Go steal something worthwhile.
Yes. There's some old TV set. <laughs> you get my point. Yes, yes, sir. But I already know that you don't have no heart to do that. To do what I'm talking about, stealing the whole state. Or taking the whole country. What's wrong with that? Why shouldn't you? Right. Matter of fact, you, you don't even have to steal it. It already belongs to you. You already paid for it. In slavery, you paid for it. In your suffering, in your death, if you got compensated for everything that has been taken from you and denied you by deceit, you have already paid for the whole damn country. That's the fact. White folks, on the other hand, they seem to have a talent for stealing, don't they? Yes, sir. They got a talent for killing, yes, don't they? Yes, sir. They have a talent for evil. And it seems like they don't get caught for it. I mean, every now and then, one of them gets disgraced and gets caught. But look at George Bush. He been lying and stealing and murdering all his life. He ain't got caught yet. Yes, sir. Come and he's trying to run for office to get a chance to do some more. That's right. But it's another devil trying to outdo him. He wants to be the devil in right. charge. That's right. right. To see who can do the most devilish. That's right. Yes. Ain't none of them running on a platform of good. That's right. No. Ain't none of them talking about justice. None of them talking about righteousness either. No, sir. They're trying to outdo one another as to who's going to bomb Iraq first. That's right. Come on. Who's going to deprive the Palestinians of their homeland first? That's right. Who's going to be the slickest in keeping the black people in their place in America? That's right. How did they get to be so good at stealing and lying and eating? Where, in fact, as I said earlier, we know they stole L.A. They stole it from the Mexicans. That's right. Stole the whole state from them. That's right. Then they write it in the history books. We stole it. They don't hide it. Took the whole country from uh, the red man, didn't they? Yes, sir. And on top of that, they stole you and me, didn't they? Yes, sir. We haven't even demanded that they take us back where they found us. Even a little child would tell a kidnapper, you take me back to my mommy. That's right. That's right. We ain't even said that much, have we? No, sir. We told the kidnapper, you can keep it. We like it here with you. We don't want to go nowhere. We ain't lost nothing in Africa. Is that right? And even though we have very little tolerance for the little things that we do to one another to offend one another, we have great tolerance for what has happened to us by the uh, hands of white people. I mean, I won't, I won't forgive my brother if he even bump up against me. I'm going to kill that nigga tonight. But the one that raped my sister and my mother and my grandmother and enslaved my fathers for hundreds of years, now I'm ready to forgive them and get mad at you if you talk about it. Some of you are mad now, I can tell you. I've been talking good about your uh, uh, white boss man for the last five to ten minutes and you, you got your jaws tight now. I don't like this kind of hate teaching. You say. He's supposed to love everybody. Says who? Where did you get that foolishness from? If the white man is the devil, then why should you love him? Do you think that God loves the devil? You want us to believe you got more love in your heart than God? No, you just showing you a big fool. That's what you're and who would trust your love anyhow? I mean, after you have hated yourself, now who's going to trust your love? And your very condition as the people shows that you don't like yourself, that you hate yourself, yet you, plant, you, you pretend like you love everybody else? 
That's why you reject it universally. The Koreans don't want nothing to do with you because you hate yourself. That's right. The Jews don't want nothing to do with you because you hate yourself. Even our own African people, most times when they come over here, they don't want nothing to do with you because you are showing in every way possible that you hate yourself. So how could they trust your love? Wait, 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 yes, sir. So there's a big difference between black people and white people. That's what we're trying to say. See, if they are the devil, then who are you? By your actions, you might be a devil. Because you do what they do. But when you do what they do, you are not doing that which is natural to yourself. But you are doing that which you saw them do. So your evil is not even really your evil. It's their evil. And God actually forgives you of all of it because you have been doing it in ignorance. Yes, sir. No one ever taught you how to be a righteous person. Right. So you didn't have no choice but to be a devil. Yes, a very unsuccessful devil. <laughs> in a country full of them. <laughs> Come here. Now just to sum this up very quickly. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that Yaqub grafted the Caucasian white people from original black people. Now, 60 years ago, back in the 30s, when we first heard that, that sounded crazy. How, how could you say it? that white people were grafted from black people. That's a fairy tale. If you read the so-called autobiography of Malcolm X, they got a little account in there about Yakub's history, but it's told in a tone of gross mockery. It's almost like Malcolm was trying to say, how could I have believed this foolishness? Right. Right. Or at least that's what Alex Haley put in it. Yeah, Malcolm didn't really write it himself. It's hard to tell where Malcolm begins and leaves off and Alex Haley begins. Because the autobiography, strictly speaking, is supposed to be written by the person themselves. But here you've got the autobiography of a man, Malcolm X, written by another man, Alex Haley. That only makes sense. Sort of cast doubt on the whole book, wouldn't you say? But in 1992, how can we doubt what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was teaching 60 years ago? You have to realize that we must uh, guard against giving too much credit to this world and how smart we think they are. See, one of the problems in our thinking is that we think white people are smarter than they are and we think that black people are dumber than they are. White folks in 1930 didn't know nothing about genetic engineering, right. <laughs> did they? No, sir. Matter of fact, if, unless you just graduated from school just a few years ago, you didn't know nothing about it till just a few years ago. Yes, now you know all about genetic engineering. Now they talk about making tomatoes through genetic engineering, and they're going to have uh, like uh, pig genes in the tomato to make the tomato fat. They're going to be having that in the supermarket real soon. Have you a pig to me? And they're making them square. Genetic engineering. You can take a natural living thing, manipulate the genetic material in it, in other words, the chromosomes, and then you can make it into something that God never created. When you do that to any living germ, then you have made a devil. Yes, sir. Yaqub did that 6,000 years ago with human beings. The scientists of the day are beginning to get to the point where they can do it with other creatures. So you have a white mouse and a white rat, or even though at home, they're mice and rats that you got at home. 
<laughs> you know the ones I mean. <laughs> you ain't never surprised a white mouse in your kitchen. Have you? You ain't never caught a white rat in no trap, have you? Although you know that scientists have made such creatures for scientific experimentation. Well, if you can do that with a mouse or rat or rabbit, any any hunters in the audience? You ever go out in the field hunting and come home with a white rabbit? No, you may never found a white rabbit out there <laughs> running in the field. But they exist, don't they? In a laboratory made by some scientists for an experiment. Well, what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is saying is exactly the same thing. That 6,600 and some odd years ago, Yaku grafted original black people and made a people that were unalike, that we call Caucasian. Right. The word Caucasian meaning stale face and weak bones. Right. And they are that. That's why they change their name and call themselves white. But it's better to be called white than it is to be called Caucasian. Who would want to be known as stale face? <laughs> Weak bones. But we see every time they try to play ball with the black man, they manifest their weak bones, don't they? <laughs> they throw their body up against the black man, the black man breaks their don't they? they go Larry Bird out with another injury. He's good as long as he's uh, healthy, but he can't stay in there with Charles Barkley and the boys. They bust him up. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Right, right. Well, how did Yaku make them? It was through a process of controlling the birth of babies. If I wanted to breed horses, could I let the horses go out there and mate any kind of way they want to? If I was breeding dogs or cattle or sheep or any creature like that, if I want to breed a certain type of cattle or sheep or goat or whatever, don't I have to control them and make sure that I choose who mates with who? Right. Well, that's what Yaqub did. He set up a system like that to control the mating of human beings because he was trying to produce certain characteristics in human beings that normally would not occur. That's right. By doing that, you can come out with a little itty bitty dog that'll fit in a teacup. You just don't let no big dogs mate with these dogs. Right. Any big dog come around, you, you you run that dog away with a stick, don't you? Leave my little dog alone. I'm trying to get me a midget here. <laughs> and if you can control that for enough generations, then you come up with a little midget dog. <laughs> Yaku was trying to do something. He was trying to solve one of the mysteries of the ages. Really trying to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. That's why you really shouldn't look at Yaqub as your enemy. Because out of what Yaqub has done comes a solution to your problem. But what is your problem? Your problem is that you would like to be like God, which is to say perfect, but you find it so difficult to achieve. <coughs> Sometimes it's like your understanding is perfect, but your ability to act on what you understand is imperfect. Yes, sir. So the Bible says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yes, sir. So we want to be Muslims because we know that is the way we should go if we want to perfect ourselves physically, mentally, and uh, spiritually or morally. But when we try to practice Islam, that's when we find out how difficult it really is. It's easy for us to know that we should pray five times a day, but it's hard for us to do it. Isn't it? It's easy for us to know that we should fast especially during the month of Ramadan, but that we should fast and eat no more than one meal a day or one meal every other day. But it's hard to put that into practice, yes, isn't it? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. We know we should tell the truth, regardless to whom or what. And it's easy to hear that being preached in the mosque, and we believe it, and we bear witness that that's right. But we end up telling lies before we hit the front door. Yes, <clears throat> Somebody asks us the wrong question that's going to put us in jeopardy, and then we go to lies. So what is it that makes it on the one hand possible for us to understand what perfection is and what righteousness is, but on the other hand, so weak that we can't seem to put it into practice? And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made it very clear that mere belief counts for nothing unless it is carried into practice. That's right. So believing in Islam, that ain't enough. You got to practice it. That's right. Believing in truth, believing in righteousness, believing in freedom, justice, and equality, that's not enough. You actually have to have the power to put it into practice. And what we have noticed all of our lives is when we go to put these principles into practice, our practice always falls short right. of the ideal. Yes, sir. For we mostly tell the truth. We're honest most of the time. We're righteous if we don't get tempted too bad. We can stay on the fast if we don't get too hungry. And I was doing good when I quit smoking till I went to the office party. And everybody in there was smoking and I, I just broke down. Yes. And I really had given up reefing. Till my no good friends came over and offered me some of them before I knew it. I don't know what happened to me. Go ahead. Isn't that the way it goes? Yes, sir. They say the road to hell is paved with what? Good intention. Good intention. <laughs> the real mystery of the ages is how come we can have such good intentions but we end up in hell? <laughs> and so Yaqub discovered this ain't good now. Yaqub discovered that in the nature of the original people of the earth, there was an unalike nature that was operating in a hidden way. That on the surface, yes, you're a good person. You're a righteous person. You're a truthful person. You're in the image and likeness of God. But underneath that, there's another reality, another hidden power or aspect of yourself that exerts a subtle influence on your thoughts and your behavior. Yes, so when you start off on the right path, pretty soon you start deviating. And before you know it, you have deviated so far, you wonder, what happened? How did I get over here? How did I get off the path? I was doing so good. Yes, Hasn't that happened to you? Yes, Don't it keep happening to you? Yes, That's why you have to keep pulling yourself back pulling yourself back and struggling and struggling and it seems the more you struggle the harder it gets. Right. Till sometimes you get to the point you just say the hell with it. Yeah, many of us say that. The hell with it. It's too hard trying to be right. Well, Yaqub said, I wonder what that is that makes us do wrong. It's hidden. It's covered up. We can't see it. Let me see what I can do to bring it out into manifest reality. Yes, sir. Yes. And so he set up a system of birth control to uh, not allow the real dark ones to marry. He did it, and they still follow it to this day. You can't just go get married because you're in love. You got to go get a license. And before they give you the license to marry, they got to take a blood test. That's, right. That's from Yaqub's day. Yes, sir. And he had the doctor to tell the people if they were real dark, well, you can't marry because your blood doesn't mix. You have to choose another man. Tell the minister, don't marry him. You know, because their blood didn't mix. That was a lie. It was just that Yaqub was trying to do something. Yes, sir. He came back and the two mates were not too dark, or one was lighter than the other, then that was permitted. 
The doctor would tell another lie and say, well, the blood mixed this time. So you can go on and get married and the preacher would marry them. <clears throat> then he would bless them and hope that they had many children. Now, when the children started being born, if the child came out real dark, then the nurse was there to deliver the child and to kill it instantly. Kill the black child, save the lighter ones. Tell the mother where your, your baby was still born. And went to heaven already to find you a place. So just keep trying. You know, maybe the next one will be good. And if the next one born was lighter, then let that one live. Present it to the mother. Tell her she gave birth to a very, very great child that would be a great man or woman one day. By doing that, over generations, within 200 years, Yaqub had produced a different population of people that were no longer black. They were brown. He continued that. Killing the dark ones, saving the light ones. Killing the dark ones, saving the light ones. Killing the dark ones, saving the light ones. Lying all the way. Lying up and down. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says, Yaqub made all of his laborers liars. They were forbidden to tell the truth. Because telling the truth would have ruined the experiment that he was carrying out. So they all became liars and they all became murderers. After 600 years, now a generation is born that is completely different and unlike the original people that they had started with. That's right. And this unlike people that now has a nature of lying and murder inbred. And all of the redeeming characteristics of morality have been taken out. Now you have a man in which there is no good at all. Now you don't have someone in the image and likeness of God. You have someone that is in the image and likeness of Satan. That is Satan. He's a liar. And the father of lies. He's a murderer. And then he's let loose on the planet. So this is what Yaqub is prophesying of. I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that rode upon him was death and hell followed after him and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword with hunger and with the beast of the earth. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says this is symbolic language that gives us the 6,000 year history of the white race. The white horse or the pale horse that represents the Caucasian people. In scripture, the horse is a symbol of power, especially the power of rulership. And it's not a stationary rulership, just like a horse is not a stationary animal. But the horse is able to cover vast different uh, distances across the earth. Isn't that right? And so the Caucasian was given power over a fourth of the earth, meaning that he was put in exile in what we call Europe. But he didn't stay confined in Europe, did he? No, sir. But he's roamed all over the earth. They're celebrating now the 500th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's voyage. And the reason they're so excited about Christopher Columbus was because Christopher Columbus showed them an escape route out of Europe. And once they escaped out of Europe and came into the New World, came into Africa, came into Asia, came into the Isles of the Pacific, came into Australia. What have they brought with them? When the white man comes in, death comes in. And what follows shortly thereafter? 
hell. So that every kingdom of people in whatever quarter of the earth, when they look at their history, they say, we were doing all right. I mean, we had our problems. But for the most part, everything was all right till these white people came in. So when they came in, the people started dying. Look at the Indians here in America. When Christopher Columbus came in to the Caribbean in 1492, there were 15 million Arab, I mean, uh, Carib and Arawak Indians. 15 million. By 1516, that number had been re reduced down to 1,500. See, that's death on a grand scale. The white man shows up, and one generation, your population is decimated. Well, how did he decimate it? Well, the scripture says that you will give, be given power to kill with the sword, with hunger, and with the beast of the earth. And so the Spaniards and the Portuguese, they came in and they slaughtered the Indians with the sword, wholesale, as many as they could kill. And then they gained control over the farmland and the production of food, and they starved them to death. And then they used the beasts of the earth to kill them. Not the big beasts, but the little beasts, the little beasties that are the microorganisms, the viruses, the bacteria, these kind of invisible beasts that uh, they carried with them out of Europe, the, the, the germ for syphilis, tuberculosis, smallpox, all of these epidemic diseases that had never been seen in the world before. The Caucasian brought these beasts with him. And in a generation, the Indians had died from these plagues of disease. So a little handful of Europeans start marching through Central America and South America, destroying in the Inca Empire and kingdom that had existed for thousands of years. They do the same thing in India, same thing in Indochina, the same thing in China, the same thing in uh, the Isles of the Pacific, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in the Hawaiian Islands, everywhere the Caucasian goes. Death is right there with him. He is death. Yeah. Don't make a mistake. We're not saying that they're wicked because they're white. The color of a man's skin is not what makes him good or bad. He's wicked because of what he does. And what he does is coming out of the nature in which he was grafted by Yaku. He has a philosophy of white supremacy. And this is poison to the mind. Because when you begin to evaluate reality on the basis of the principles of white supremacy, then you are believing in a lie. And whatever you establish on the face of a lie cannot endure. And so when the structure of your mind is based on the lie of white supremacy, then your mind goes out of existence. So the Caucasian takes over the educational system wherever he goes. And he destroys the history of the people. He destroys their respect for one another. He destroys their own philosophies, their own religions, and replaces it with something from himself. And when he is able to take a, a good image of black people out of the mind of black people and replace it with the image of himself, then he has destroyed your mind. He did it among all people. Not just the black people, but the red people, the yellow people, everywhere, all over the earth. And of course, he's done the same thing in religion. In the spiritual realm, he's produced spiritual death. So Islam today is not what it's supposed to be because it's been taken over by the devil himself. Christianity today is not what Jesus was teaching. Because they not only crucified him, but they crucified his teaching. Put it to death. 
and then substituted some mystery slave-making religion in its stead that backs up and supports white supremacy. I remember about 15 years ago when Reverend Moon first came on the scene from Korea. And he was trying to bring about a religious revival in America. They interviewed him on TV, and I was watching. I said, I want to see what this Korean's talking about. I mean, he's acting like he's getting ready to take over America or something. He said, well, Reverend Moon, uh, you're on this crusade. Well, how did you get inspired to do such a thing? He said, well, I had a dream. And in this dream, I saw Moses. I saw Jesus. And I saw Muhammad. And they spoke to me in this dream and told me what I'm supposed to be doing. You actually saw Jesus in a dream, Reverend Moon? Yes, yes. Well, how did you know it was him? Well, he looked just like the pictures. I said, uh oh. If it looked like that picture that Michelangelo painted, right. uh -huh. then it means that this devil is so clever that he penetrates even into the subconscious mind of people. So that even in your dream, you think you're having some divine inspiration in your dream, and it's the devil right there at the core of your mind, coming into your mind, speaking to you like he's the angel of life. Like it's the voice of God. And sending you out to make a fool of you. So death is riding a pale horse. Oh, yes. <laughs> what white folks are saying to us and to the whole world is sort of like Shakespeare's sonnet. You know, Shakespeare wrote the sonnet. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. White folks are saying, how can I kill thee? Let me count the ways. Shall I, shall I kill you with the sword? Or would you prefer a gun? Or would you prefer to put on one of my uniforms so I can send you to a foreign battlefield somewhere to yes, die? Sir. Yes, sir. Would you like me to kill you in your water supply? Yes, sir. Or should I kill you in your food supply? Yes, sir. Or should I send crack cocaine into your neighborhood so you can smoke that? Yes, oh, you don't like cocaine? Well, let me supply you with heroin so you can inject it in your veins. Yes. How shall I kill thee? You got a free mind. You got a free will. Why don't you tell me the way in which you want me to kill you? Oh, you don't want to be killed by a white man's hand. Well, then I'll put the gun in your brother's hand. And I will influence his mind through records and through movies and through TV so that he will become your murderer. I will make your own children your murderers. Yes, I will make your own teachers the murderers of your own mind because I won't teach you white supremacy myself, but I will send a teacher into the schoolhouse to teach you white Listen. supremacy. Listen. I won't teach you religion myself, but I will get one of your own people and ordain them as a preacher to come into the church in front of an all-black uh, 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 congregation and teach them to bow down to a Caucasian Jesus. How can I kill you? Let me count the ways. Oh, you like sex. Well, let me see if I can put death in sex since you love to do that and nobody can stop you from doing that. Jesus tried to get you under control. Muhammad tried to get you under control. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad tried to get your sexual passions under control. And we notice, even though you would put down the heroin sometimes and put down the alcohol sometimes, you ain't never put that down. Yeah. Oh. 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 
right. it had already programmed your culture. We had the Isley brothers crooning to you. Yeah. If you can't be with the one you love, then love the one you with. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to suck it to. It's your thing. And so since you like to do it, then I put death in doing it. And here we have syphilis. Here we have gonorrhea. Here we have AIDS, which is death made perfect. So death is riding a pale horse. Power was given to them to rule with the sword, with hunger, and with the beasts of the earth. So their power to rule does not reside in the qualities of justice, in freedom, in equality, in truth, in any of those lofty principles that were enunciated by the prophets. Their ability to rule is based on one thing and one thing alone, and that is their ability to kill. That's right. That's right. So the last time Minister Farrakhan was here in LA, what was he talking about? Stop the killing. He said in one place, we can't stop the killing until we stop the killer. Well, how did you take his speech? If you took it like most people did, you thought Minister Farrakhan was talking about uh, the gangbangers yes. who was responsible for the killing. Uh -huh. And yes, in part, he was. But look how quickly the gangbangers have responded to the word of a divine messenger. Yes, 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 yes. They stopped the killing, haven't they? They stopped the killing. They realize that that ain't the way. They're looking for a new way. And so they're following in the footsteps of Minister Louis Farrakhan. And as they follow his footsteps, he shows them a better way of life and how to avoid death. But the gangbangers, they was never the major killers. They was just little small time killers. George Bush and the boys, those are the big time killers. Those are the big time killers. They kill a million and a half babies every year in the abortion clinics. They kill a half a million uh, in the Iraq war, dropping their smart bombs. Very few of the half million were actually soldiers in uniform. Most of who they killed were women and children. Look at how they control the food supply in Africa so that now they're saying that one third of the people in Somalia uh, could be dead of starvation in just the next few days. Listen, listen. Saying that 40 to 50 to 50 to 60 million black people in Africa will be dead of AIDS early in the 21st century. Think about this. In most of Africa right now, as well as Central and South America, their policies of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund have produced a situation of negative population growth. That means that more people are being killed than are being born. They're talking about reducing the population of the earth. This is Jimmy Carter in his report. Uh, called Global 2000. They want to reduce the population of the earth by 2.7 billion people by the year 2000. Right. Death rides a pale horse. Might be Democratic, might be Republican, but the agenda is still the same. They might be American, they might be British, they might be French, they might be German or Italian, but the agenda is all the same. It's genocide against non-white people. Matter of fact, why should we expect better treatment at their hands than they give their own people? Look at Europe. They're fighting wars on top of wars in Europe today, aren't they? 
Who started World War One? Was it black folks? No, Was it the Bloods and the Crips that started World War Two? No, nah, white folks. If they can't kill black folks, they don't mind killing each other. Do they? No, sir. Do they? Yet you think that they're supposed to uh, do better by you than they do themselves. Think about it. Rodney King. When, when, did you, when was it ever illegal for white people to beat black people in America? Think about it. When was it ever illegal? That ain't against the law. America wouldn't be America if they didn't beat black people. Kill black people. Matter of fact, white folks just scratching their head. What are y'all so upset about? We, we usually kill niggas like that. Matter of fact, they wonder why he didn't die. Because they put the kind of whooping on a man that's designed to kill a man. But he's just a black man. And he don't die that easy. He's of the tribe of Shabazz. Like yeah. 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 Shabazz is the name given to the tribe that produces the gods. Those that survived the deportation of the moon 66 trillion years ago are called Shabazz. We are the children of our father Shabazz who sat in the circle of the gods 50,000 years ago. That's a wonderful name. That which cannot be conquered, that which cannot be destroyed. That's who you are. And so brothers and sisters, we're at the end of this age of death where white folks have literally given it their best. The good old college tribe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that any of us are still alive today is through no fault of us that we're still alive. Listen to what he's saying. If George Washington and Thomas Jefferson could see 30 to 40 to 50 million blacks and uh, Chicano brothers and sisters and uh, Indian brothers and sisters in America still alive in 1992, they would be turning in their graves. Because they had set in motion uh, an agenda and a, and a policy in this country that was designed to destroy us all together. Your very existence is a threat to them. And so that's why today, brothers and sisters, we're not justified in harboring any fear at all except the fear of God, which is considered to be the beginning of wisdom. They do that good, don't they? <laughs> After you have been confronted with what we have been confronted with already, then what justifies your fear today. Why are you still afraid of white people? Good question. Good. They are dead. Right. And they have had complete and absolute power over us for the past 400 years. Right. They did to us anything that they could think of to do to us. And the object always was to destroy us from the face of the earth. And so they have done their worst, and we are still here looking at them in the face. So what does that tell you? It tells you that you and I are more powerful than death. We are more powerful than white people. And that all that we have to do is to come back into the knowledge and the love of self and kind. We must take away with the messenger that God has raised in our midst. Yes. And if we do that, then we will not death off the pale horse. And then we will take the pale horse to the glue factory. Come on. I heard that. Come on. I heard that. Amen on that. Because we will absolutely be the conquerors of death. 
And so we can now go all over the earth or stay here. Because before this thing is over, over, brothers and sisters, you're going to see Minister Farrakhan as the head of the nation of Islam. He is absolutely going to conquer America. He is absolutely going to take America. It's the 27th verse in the 33rd chapter. It reads, and he made you heirs to their land and their dwellings and their property into a land which you have not yet trodden. And Allah is ever possessor of power over all things. Yes, he so, brothers and sisters, I thank you for your patience. And thank you. become a student of the teachings of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. 
Yes, sir. That's the only way that you can be sure about anything. Right. Isn't that right? Yes, That's right. right. You got to try it out. So what I would ask you to do is try this. You know, put a limit on it. Give yourself 30 days where you will come back. We meet every Sunday at 2 o'clock, Wednesdays and Fridays at 8 o'clock. You just make it a point to be here as often as you can for the next 30 days. Get the Holy Quran, get message to the black man, other literature that we have available, and just study it. Yes, sir. And try to understand it and learn it and put it into practice. And then if, if after 30 days you don't like it anymore, then you go on back to what you've been doing. Can, can you agree to something like that? Because that's all I can say to you. I can't ask you to join what you don't fully understand. I can't talk about converting you to become Muslims because I know that by your very nature you already are a Muslim. So you might not understand that yet. You just need to study. So that's all that we can ask you to do is just study. So how many of you would, would be willing to do some amount of studying to get a better understanding about what you do. I'm going I'm to ask, ask the brothers here, within 30 days, how are you doing? Yes, sir. And I bet that they will be able to answer me in truth, that you'll, you'll be doing a lot better then than you are now. That's right. And I don't know how well you might be doing right now, but whatever it is, it's going to be better as a result of what you learn of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, just one other thing that I feel that I must do, and that is to do what Minister Farrakhan would do if he were here. And as a representative of his, he, he would normally want to shake your hand. He would want to meet you and give you the greeting. And so on his behalf, may I have the same honor? Yes, sir. So if... Yes, sir. if the sisters on this side, if you just come down the aisle, brothers, you just come this way, however way, way you do it, then I'll just come down here. And Please receive him. Oh, is that the final word? <laughs> <laughs> I'm working you over time. <laughs> you got him working. But let's, yes, sir. Let me just say this. Yes, sir. Let me just say this. Let me just say this. Yes, sir. Those of you who are here as visitors and I just had the opportunity to shake your hand and you're looking at Islam, you're looking at the nation of Islam as a possible direction for your life. And even those of you who are already in the nation, let me just say something to you. 
This is right. Don't have no doubt about it. The Holy Quran says that Islam is like a handle. That if you grab hold of it, it will never break off from you unless you break off from it. It is something that you can rely upon. I remember when I was in the nation for 14 days, and I found myself just grinning because I was just so happy to be in the nation. I used to get up. I was happy when I got up, happy when I went to bed. After a while, I said, this is unreal. I said, I almost pinched myself. Yes, sir. See if this was really real. And I've been pinching myself for 24 years. I'm still happy. I said, when is the bubble going to burst? And I see what the real deal is. Well, the bubble does not burst. This is our natural way of life. It puts you in heaven at once. Now, this doesn't mean that you won't be tried. Right. Matter of fact, even those of you who are here for your first time, a trial of sorts is waiting for you as soon as you go home today. That's right. That's right. When you try to tell somebody at home what you heard today, <laughs> they're going to give you a fit. That's right. They might. I'm just saying they might. <laughs> Depending on the level of their understanding. That's right. But no matter what they say, no matter what they do, you know what you heard. Yes, sir. And more than that, you know what you experienced on the inside. So you allow yourself to be guided by that. And trials will come and trials will go. But never, never, ever turn your back on the truth and go in the other direction. Because when you do that, as the Holy Quran says, he who rejects right guidance when it comes to him surely makes a fool of himself. So brothers and sisters, may Allah bless you as you take step after step in the regaining of the knowledge and love of yourself, and sooner than you think, Allah will change this condition that you are in with a better condition and will have you elevated higher than you ever would imagine that life could uh, elevate you to. So with that, let me greet you once again as I dismiss myself with the greetings of peace. As-salamu alaykum. Let's give a well-deserved round of applause for our Governor Minister, Dr. Ali Muhammad. Thank you, Dr. Ali Muhammad. The National Sportsman for the Honor Lewis Five Times. And the Minister of Health and Human Resources, Dr. Ali Muhammad. For the Nation's Air Force Medal, Dr. Ali Muhammad. And the Honor Lewis Five Times. Thank you, Dr. Ali Muhammad. 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 Thank you, Dr. Ali
Please get the tape. Please get the tape. It was worlds of information in those presentations. Worlds of information. Things about this dreaded disease and the history that you wouldn't even imagine that brother dropped. But you weren't there. We needed your support because we had tickets for sale, but a lot of people don't want to hear about this dreaded disease called AIDS. Because we don't even know what our status is, right? How many of us have been tested? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> you can if you want. But what I'm saying is there's a lot of work to be done and there's only a few to do that work. And now we're coming to you to appeal to you in the name of Allah to give some money to help not only the AIDS program, but we have obligations right here. We have rent to pay. We have lights to take care of. We have the school to uphold. Is that right? Yes, sir. We have many, many things to do with the money that we ask you for. And so at this time, I would like for the receptacles to come and please don't leave if you don't have to. And if you do have to leave, put some money in the bucket. But right now, I'm going to ask for any sizable donations. Are there any 100s or anyone out there that would like to give $1,000 today or $500 today to help the continuation of the program and the work of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan? What other black leader have you seen that is waging war against AIDS and winning? Yes, huh? Well, can you back a man like that? Yes, sir. The theme for the program of the University of Islam was rhetorically asked throughout that program, do you want your freedom? Yes, sir. And the answer was, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. But what are we willing to do to ensure that we have freedom? Huh? Are we willing to give our money? Are we willing to give our talent, our ideas, huh? a kind word to a brother and sister who may be down in the dumps that day? Just giving the greetings of assalamu alaikum, the greetings of peace, is a blessing and is a part of charity. But we know that charity is one of the pillars of Islam. It is a principle of action. And it's something that we're asking you to do right now. Who has the first donation? Yes, ma'am. Anonymous, $100. Please give them a hand. All praises be to Allah. We're not going to be alone tonight with this, brothers and sisters. And we're not calling for this kind of money so that you can be seen of men. We are calling for this money because we absolutely need it. Yes, ma'am. Sister Anna X, one hundred dollars. All praise to Allah. Allah Akbar. All praise to Allah. As we stated, week in and week out, we don't have the power to take it out of your check, like the white man does it, like the government of this country does it. We don't have that kind of power. We have to ask you for it. So we're appealing to you, in the name of Allah to do something for yourself while you still have a chance. Yes, sir. Anonymous $50. Anonymous $50. Give them a hand, please. All praise And please give, get a receipt for the money that you give today. Please get a receipt for your records. Are there any other 100s out there? Anybody want to give a 1,000 today? 500. I'm not embarrassed to ask you. That's right. That's right. I, really not, I really am not. There are times when we have asked for a thousand that brothers and sisters have answered the call and have given their hard earned money to a program worthy, worthy of giving it to. We're asking you, we're appealing to you in the name of Allah and his messenger to give to this program. Where are the other hundreds? Hundreds, fifties. We're not gonna be a long time either. Hundreds, we need an FOI report and an MGT report. 
We need both brothers and sisters involved with this, and we need to come together as one. An anonymous $50. Anonymous $50. Give him a hand, please. All praise is due to Allah. Where are the donations? The teaching that we have received, brothers and sisters, will actually save us money. That's right. Yes, it will. It will save us money. It will save us money in our doctor bills. Because we won't get sick so often because we don't eat the wrong food. How many can bear witness? It's a lot of hands. All praise is due to Allah. Where are the hundreds, fifties? Quickly, brothers and sisters, we want to make this as fast as possible and as painless as possible. Sometimes it's like pulling teeth up here, asking you for the money. But it's necessary, as I stated before. 50s, 100s, 20s, any 20s, 20s, who would like to give a 20? Anonymous, $20. Anonymous, $20, give them a hand. Oh, please. 20s, 25s, yes, sir. Anonymous, $20. Anonymous, $20, give them a hand. Yes, sir. Anonymous $10. Anonymous $10. Give them a hand. We don't discount one penny that you give. Every penny, every dollar, every five, ten, fifty, a hundred, or a thousand dollars that you give, we thank Almighty God Allah first for blessing you to give it. Yes, ma'am. $50. Sister Cynthia X, $50. Give her a hand, please. Oh, please. Quickly, brothers and sisters. Yes, ma'am. Sister Cheryl Muhammad, $20. Sister Cheryl Muhammad, $20. Yes, sir. Brother Muhammad, twenty-five dollars. Brother Muhammad, twenty-five dollars. Give me my hand. Wouldn't you feel bad if we accomplished what we will accomplish, inshallah, without you? Wouldn't you feel bad standing on the sideline waiting to see if they're going to be successful or not? depending whether you will uh, join on, like you are looking at a popularity poll or something? Huh? Wouldn't you feel bad when we march into the heaven that we build with our own hands, and here you come? Assalamu alaikum, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wouldn't you feel bad? Wouldn't you feel kind of cheap? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Huh? That you didn't wage war when you had the chance, when you were young and strong? Huh? Wouldn't you feel kind of funny when Islam is all that you will see? The principles of truth in God and righteousness will be all that you see? And you are not a part of that because you chose to go another way? Wouldn't you feel kind of bad? Yes, ma'am. Little two-year-old baby, Sister Hania. 25 cents. 25 cents for Sister Baby Hania. Give her a hand. Yes, ma'am. Anonymous $20. Give them a hand, please. Twenties, twenty-fives, tens, fives, whatever you can give. Whatever Allah blesses you with to give. Yes, sir. Brother Nelson, $2. Brother Nelson, $2. Give that black man. Yes, sir. Brother Sheldon, ten dollars. Give that soldier your hand. Yes, ma'am. 
Anonymous, $2. Give them a hand. Yes, sir. Brother Nathan, $7. Brother Nathan, $7. Give them a hand. For the David, $10. Yes, sir. For the Ray, $10. Give him a hand. Yes, ma'am. Sister Carietics, $10. Sister $10. Give her a hand. Yes, sir. For that. Brother Ritz, $5. Give him a hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Two anonymous $5. Two anonymous $5. This was $10. Give them a hand. All three. We would like to close in prayer, so don't leave if you don't have to. Yes, ma'am. Anonymous five dollars. Anonymous five dollars. Give them a hand. At this time, could we pass the buckets? Let's pass the buckets, and anything that you want to give, drop it in there, please. And we thank you for coming today. We thank you for spending this afternoon with us as our brothers. Brother and sister, uh, sisters gave the words that they gave today. Yes, sir, my brother. Anonymous fifty dollars. Give him a hand, please. All praise to God. We thank you for coming out today, and we ask that you continue to come. For those of you who uh, accepted and would like to study, as Brother Minister asked. We have a class for the brothers tomorrow night, orientation class, beginning at 7.30, where you can learn more about what we are studying. Come out at 7.30. For the sisters, we have a class called MGT class, and come out at 8 a.m. Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings at 8 a.m. Come out for the orientation class for the MGT. Also, we have our regular Wednesday night meetings at 8, Friday meetings at 8. Monday is FOI men's training and orientation class. And Saturday for MGT class is at 9. Is that correct? For the sisters, the women's training and orientation class, that's for sisters only. I would like to thank our brother for coming out. He would like to give greetings from the Christian community. Dr. McBroom, brother, would you take it? Salam alaikum. I'm delighted to be here, and some of you may recognize or remember that I was here a couple of years ago. And it was so beautiful because when I got up this morning, I did not anticipate being here. But I'm an officer in the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance. And what some of you may not know, your minister, Wazir Muhammad, has come to us and he has said what we need is unity. And that's what I believe and that's what I feel. And I was so delighted to have come this afternoon yes, sir. and to meet this young dynamic minister, Charles X. And I want you to know that when you should really give yourselves another hand of applause, and I'll tell you why. Because you've looked at your situation, and you've said, let me do something about it. Yes. Give yourselves a hand of applause. <laughs> and I did want to leave just a couple of ideas with you that may shock you. Now, as you may know, the Bible is written metaphorically. That is, they give illustrations like we mentioned about the sheep and the goats and all of that. But did you know that the latest scientific evidence, I want you to hear this, oh, Brother Charles, I don't know if you're aware of this, that the latest scientific evidence that was discovered at the University of South Carolina and the University of Connecticut simultaneously in the studying of the DNA has traced all human beings back to a woman in Africa. Were you aware of it? How many of you were aware of that? I want you to, in other words, I'm saying this has now been scientifically validated. The other thing that I want you to repeat after me, I heard three or four, a couple of the doctors here saying this. I want you to say this after me. Would you say trying, trying is, is pretending. pretending. 
Allah does not try. Allah does. Try not. Just do it. And that's what I want you to do. When you make up your minds that you're going to be in the faith, that you're going to do what you have to do, do it. Stop telling Brother Charles and Brother Charles that I'm, I'm going to try. No, trying won't get it. That's right. You've got to do it. That's right. I'd like to go just one step further. Would you repeat this after me? Because let's say God, God. is a God, God. of action. God. On the plains of, of hesitation. hesitation. Bleach the bones of countless millions. Who? At the break of dawn, sit down to worry and to wait. And worrying and waiting, they die. Thank you. You're beautiful. Dr. McGrew. Brothers and sisters, we had an MGT report. Was that 109? Is that correct? 109 was turned in by the MGT. 109, let's give a hand for the MGT. 109. Did we get a count from the FOI? Did we get a count from the brothers? While we're waiting on that, what I, what I would like to do, because we will have to have a holdover meeting for the MGT, all registered uh, and processing brothers and sisters, please remain behind and our visitors and guests will be dismissed. Uh, would everyone please stand? We want to close in prayer and have uh, the FOI and the MGT, those in processing, remain behind. Position of prayer. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbi Al-Alameen, Ya Rahman Rahim, Maliki Yawm Al-Din. Iyaka Nahabudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. Inna Sirat Al-Mustaqeen, Sirat Al-Adhin Anamdi Alayhim, Kareer Al-Maktubi Alayhim, Wa Nadalim. Bismillah, Rahman Rahim, Kufu Lahu Ahad, Allahu Samad, Lam Yulid wa Lam Yulad, Wa Lam Yakuruhu Kufu Wan Ahad. I seek refuge in thee, O Allah, from the accursed shaitan. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, the beneficent, the merciful, master of the day of judgment in which we now live. Thee alone do we serve, and thee alone do we beseech for thine aid. Guide us on the right path, the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed thy favors, not the path of those upon whom wrath is brought down, nor of those who go astray after they have heard thy teaching. Say he, Allah is one. Allah is he of whom nothing is independent, but upon whom we all depend. He neither begets nor is he begotten, and there is none like him. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, I bear witness the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is the exalted Christ. And I bear witness that the honorable Louis Farrakhan is their divine reminder, servant, messenger. Amin. Brothers and sisters, you are dismissed. Visitors and guests.